that kind of morning, guys. Can't get the iPod working. Why? Thanks for joining this morning. Get the cup of Joe running. We're on uh, uh, Salt Lake City for the Illy Coffee this morning. You gotta get it started. You gotta get it started. Man, what a morning. What a morning. Running out of time. Can't get the iPad running. Have to rough through that today. We'll have to fight our way through what's going on there. Getting the YouTubes up. Getting our reference up for later. Man. Chilly in the morning. Nice in the daytime. We got the uh, fall is coming. Fall's upon us, I think. Fall's right here. Um, got a couple good things to talk about today, if you don't know. Um, while we're getting everybody in here, we'll talk about this first one. Guy Fawkes Day. Um, Guy Fawkes went to try to blow up the parliament, man. If you watch the movie, you'll see that. Wanted to get the Catholic Church back in England. So him and a bunch of folks called it Gunpowder Day, too, trying to blow up Parliament to make their voices heard. So, you know, unrest, civil unrest even back then. Uh, put a link in your show notes to the Britannica Library. Not the library, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember growing up as a kid, you guys might not remember this. You guys might be too young for this. When I was growing up as a kid, we had the encyclopedia, big set of books. Had to go do your research project. You had to go grab the right book. Looking for Guy Fawkes. I got to go look for, maybe it's in G. Let me look in G. You know, maybe it's under F for Fawkes. Let me try to find it. I find the right book. This one's G through F or whatever. F through G, whatever. Had to find the book. Had to look it up. Then you had to copy it word for word. No, just cut and paste out of there. That's how you had to... Work through it when you were a kid. We got the crew coming in this morning, folks. Making it up in here. I don't have the. Uh, I don't have my mouse to start with. Where you at? Let's get our comments up there. Come on, comments. It's a struggle this morning. Wow. Comments and reactions. There we go. Good morning, Eric. Good to see you. Richard's here as well. Good. A good dandy morning to you. So Guy Fawkes Day. We see, of course, we we see the Guy Fawkes mask uh, today. Probably more than back when it was originally worn. Folks like uh, Anonymous and folks trying to hide their identities from, I guess, during civil unrest or from prying eyes of big government, I guess, or big corporation or whatever. You put the Guy Fawkes mask on, go out there and you can be on anonymous. Um, we see that all the time now. So that's what it comes from. You guys probably, there was a movie about it uh, several years ago talking about trying to blow up Parliament and why they were doing it. Right here, good morning. Morning, morning. So we've got a lot of stuff to talk about this morning. Probably won't be as long a show as yesterday. Yesterday we ran for about an hour because we were digging through bass lines. Um, but as you know, we're going kind of backwards. Today we're going to talk about controls. Because you got, you know, I think Janet Jackson said you got to take control. you got to get control. Five, four, three, two, one. Um, so controls. We know controls. We know what we started kind of, at, you know, tailoring. Then we went to back, back to baselines, and now we're going back to controls. And I know, guys, come on, I know you're like, this stuff's out of order. Jim, you're out of order. This whole place is out of order. Um, I know we're going backwards through it. And it's because we just kind of just starting this new format, but we guarantee that you're going to learn something if you hang around today. You'll learn about NIST Special Publication 853, Revision 5. Revision 5. We're going to talk about Revision 5 today and what is inside 
it's lofty volume. Um, it is a big book. It's a big, big book. And we know there's, you know, 53, 53A, 53B, all these things we need to know about. But today, today we need to know about the controls. We need to know about the controls. I wanted the iPad up and running today because we we'll walk through Docker. Our vulnerability we're going to talk about from the news is Docker. Um, well, containers, I should say. It's not necessarily Docker, but contain. when I say containers, I think about Docker. They didn't specifically call out Docker, so I should be clear in that, but we're going to talk about containers a bit and what they're all about, you know, what they're all, what is their deal? What's your deal, dude? I think what I'm going to do before we get started, before we get started, I'm going to grab our PowerPoint that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about 853. Revision 5, but I'm going to steal one of these slide slides out of here. And we're going to you're going to turn it into a whiteboard. We're going to just use this as a whiteboard because I can't get the iPad working uh, this morning. So when we get to Docker, we'll steal one of the slides out of the slide deck we're going to use later. And we'll talk about Docker. We'll talk about it inside of PowerPoint. So let's jump in there. Let's throw the intro out at you and get back to talking about this stuff. Doo -doo -doo. So our story in the news today, what we're going to start with, we're going to start with the news and then we're going to roll on, of course, to talking about NIST, right? Um, so this is some dark reading and dark reading has a lot of good stuff out there. Um, put this in your, put this in the show notes in case you want to check it out. It says containers for data analysis are rife with vulnerabilities. It's not the first time we've talked about containers. Containers have been in the news before for, guess what, containing vulnerabilities. So this story from Robert Limos, old software components and the inclusion of unnecessary code created a massive attack surface area in containers for scientific analysis researchers say. And we're going to expand on this a bit. We'll start out with the article. Regular updating software components can eliminate two-thirds of the vulnerabilities found in container images. While minimizing, the number of libraries can also reduce attack surface in some cases. According to research by a team at Concordia University in Montreal. Some of you may know some of you out there went to Concordia University uh, on this side of the border to teach for Concordia. I've seen some of you in Concordia when I used to teach there. Uh, the research, which focused on containerized applications used in high-performance computing or HPC environments for neuroimage processing, and analyzed 44 container images using vulnerability scanners and found the average Look at 44. The average among the 44, the average image had 320, 320 vulnerabilities. Containers based on lightweight Linux distributions such as Alpine Linux had fewer vulnerabilities, suggesting that minimizing the volume of code can also reduce the number of vulnerabilities, the research team said in a paper they posted online last week. Obviously, smaller smaller OS, less code, less options, less functionality is going to be more secure. A bloated OS, Windows, um, but any any OS that gets too much functionality is going to get too much attack surface. So limit it down. We're talking about Docker servers. We're talking about the OS that runs under Docker. And we can have two levels here, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, lighter weight OS underneath these dockers is better. While researchers focused on containerized applications for analyzing images of the brain, the issue with vulnerabilities is not particular to that discipline or data science packages, says Tristan Glettard, associate professor of the Defa Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering at Concordia. The problem is general not specific to a particular data analysis software or OS 
distribution. Distributed? Distribution. There's no particular bad guy. We didn't find a particular origin of vulnerabilities. There's this article goes on and on and on talking about containers and what we can do about them. But do you know? Do you know what a container is? There's D. Good morning. Morning, D. Good to see you. Yeah, so they're the numbers they found on this crazy. Vulnerabilities found varied from 1,700 on one image to nearly zero on others. So just, it, it, it's crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, minimize the number of packages, reduce the number of vulnerabilities, of course. The no impact was uneven. In some cases, removing unnecessary packages had no impact, especially when there were few extraneous packages. However, using the Alpine Linux distribution, a minimal version of the Linux community uh, commonly used uh, uh, as a base image for Docker containers, typically reduce the attack surface. Container images based on Alpine Linux are an exception. They have less vulnerabilities overall. It isn't because of a better software or anything other than limiting the number of software packages on the Linux image. And this, is, this really is a, a good point. Remove packages, remove services, remove connections and protocols and remove stuff you don't need. Strip your operating systems down. Take stuff off you don't need or start from a very minimal system to start with. And this ties into what we're talking today because we're talking about controls and we're controlling our environment with the use of these safeguards and protections that we put in place to control vulnerabilities. And we control vulnerabilities by reducing our attack surface. And we've got to reduce our attack surface. That's what's going to help us reduce our vulnerabilities and our risk. So we reduce the vulnerabilities, we can reduce our risk. That's the way it works. You can't attack a package that's not installed. And that's the that's the short and long of it. So what I do, I'm gonna do, and it's gonna be ugly. There's a little gnat flying around in here. I'm gonna move the whiteboard over um, that I just just now created. Let's make this full screen. Let's make this full screen, and then again, because it's Apple, we're gonna make this full screen again. Let's switch over to the PowerPoint view of our newly created whiteboard because our, like I said, our iPad is just not working. So here's our made up whiteboard. Uh, I can't even, I'm gonna have to, oh man, guys, come on, come on. Uh, okay, here's our made up whiteboard. Now we're gonna have to do it this way because <laughs> guess things just don't work right. Um, so we're talking talk, talk about virtualization, virtualization to start with. That's where we've got to start, right? So virtualization, we start with an OS, right? An operating system. Um, there are two, two basic types of virtualization we can have, right? Um, and let's actually, let's make this different. Let's, uh, let's start at a lower level. This is hardware. This is the server. The computer you're talking about, right? So we're going to ha have this, and we're going to talk about type one and type two hypervisors, right? So next thing we need to do is we need our hypervisor, something that's going to control virtualization, right? Let's throw this up here. Now, oh, guys. Our hyper, hyper, our hypervisor in type one sits right on top of our hardware. There's very, very little bloat here because we're sitting so close to the the, uh, the hardware and we have minimal code, right? Um, our type two, on the other hand has an OS, um, has an operating system. So this could be, or this could be Windows or Linux, right? But there's an operating system sitting here, 
very bloated. The dependency of that is, is different. So, and then we have the hypervisor, right? So now we have the hypervisor. And then in traditional, traditional virtualization, right? Um, what we're going to have is a, a virtualized machine, a VM, right? A, a VM that's going to sit on top of all of the stack, right? And this virtualized machine, bring all this down, guys. This virtualized machine can make use of the hardware. And you might think, what is the point of putting all of this junk in the middle so I can just use the hardware down here? Why not just build my stuff on Linux here? Well, the thing is, we can install multiple virtual machines on this same hypervisor, right? So a lot of you guys know this. This is not earth shattering to most of you. And it's been around since mainframe. This has been around since mainframe. So we have multiple multiple virtual machines, right? One could be Linux, you know, one could be Windows. Um, the one could be a server, one could be a workstation. We can have all servers on here. We can have all kinds of stuff running on this, this hardware. So we can utilize our hardware in a better fashion because now we're we're virtualizing our load, right? So maybe this Linux machine over here is using like 15%, right? So we're not using a whole server for 15%. Maybe it's 15%, 15%, 15%, 15%. Now we're using one server and we're getting four servers out of it and we're sharing the RAM, we're sharing the hard drive, we're sharing the processors, all that stuff we're sharing amongst all four of these machines, right? They're all virtualized and this scales. It's part of what the cloud is all about. And we get to, get to cloud, we'll talk more about that. But that's why virtualization is important, right? So now we got these virtual machines that sit on top of a hypervisor. Um, and if we wanna run an application, we can put, you know, in this virtual machine, we can put like a LAMP stack, right? Um, we can have our Apache and we can have our database and we can have PHP and all that stuff. We can have a web server that lives on there, right? We've got a web server. But what if we could take this one level further? You know, because maybe we've got this virtual machine is running four or five things and we don't want those things talking to each other. Well, now on the virtual machine, let's say this is a Linux machine. Um, we can put Docker on there. We're going to make this machine just a little fatter here. And, and the funny thing now is we can virtualize applications. So now we can have applications that run in this isolated mode, in this virtualization. So now we can have multiple applications on top of this Docker. So now we're going one level further. So now the applications can share all the hardware, all the access, but we containerize them. So that if we don't want them talking to each other, they don't talk to each other. And we know one of the vulnerabilities we talk about is, you know, maybe we have a Chrome running on our Windows machine and there's a vulnerability in Chrome that allows the attacker to go from Chrome to our Windows box and exploit our Windows box. Well, we can we, we can t containerize these things and keep them from talking to each other. So now our web server won't talk to um, whatever, our, our, our application that runs um, a mileage tracker or something, right? So that's what container is all about. We're extracting stuff to another level of of virtualization. We virtualized an environment for that app. One thing we can do also is if we want to, we can also put an operating system here and then the app. Depending how you build your environment. So this is the big look at containers, right? So the big component is this Docker. If we have Docker running, right? We can build apps, we can containerize apps, or we can containerize apps and an OS. So we could put, 
you know, Alpine Linux here, and then a app that runs on Alpine Linux. But maybe you have an app that doesn't run on Alpine Linux. It needs Red Hat. We could put Red Hat here and run it there. And then the third one maybe runs on the underlying OS here. So we're getting a lot more flexibility. And here's the good part. This is where, where cloud is, this plays into cloud very well, right? So if we don't want lock-in, we don't want to be stuck in a particular cloud, maybe we don't like Amazon anymore, we can take these containers, because everything's been containerized, everything lives in these containers, and we can go from this area, we can take all our containers and go somewhere else where Docker is. We don't have to stay here. We take our apps, we move them somewhere else. I mean, that's not, that's not the, 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 you know, collegiate level of Docker. That's not the down and dirty. That's not everything you need to know about Docker, but that's an overview of Docker. That's what, what is important about thinking about Docker. So we're thinking about these containers containing between three and 400 vulnerabilities each. And we've got to stomp, stomp that out. You got to make secure decisions when you build the things like this, right? Um, NAT, a NAT in here. So that's the first thing. That's what we got about. So we have to think about reducing the size of our applications, reducing the size of our operating systems, reducing the attack surface. And part of that is through the use of controls. And that's kind of what we've been talking about all week is controls, right? Tailoring controls, looking at how to set the baseline. And now we're looking at the, the, the controls themselves, right? So let's jump over, let me actually make this the right size now. Let's jump over here. And what we're talking about is, is a reference document we use in, in RMF. So for RMF cap, uh, RMF cap, our, our cap certification, um, one of the reference documents we have is NIST Special Publication 853, which is the control catalog. And the current version, newly released, newly minted, is revision five, and that's what we see here. NIST Special Publication 853 R5, or revision five. So you probably need to know the details of what's going on here. And this is the first thing people ask is, how robust is this catalog? How many controls are in here? And, and, then, and you guys know, if you've been around, you know I wanna be very specific when we talk about controls. There's controls, and then there's control enhancements, right? So that's two different things. And we obviously have talked about that plenty of times, right? So here's your counts. Your counts are right up there. In NIST Special Publication 853, there are 20 families. Um, this has increased over the, over the life cycle of 853. Um, 16, 17, 20 is where we're at now. 20 families. Um, in the catalog, there are 322 controls. And you guys, if you're paying attention yesterday, you were like, we're, we're talking about baselines. We know that the high watermark that it is for the high impact baseline had 365 controls. How can there be uh, 322 controls in the, the entire catalog? Well, that's because there's 365 controls and enhancements, right? So think about that. The controls, there's 322 controls, and then there's 867 enhancements of those controls. So our total is 1189. So if we talk about controls and enhancements, there's 1189. And they're broken up over 20 families, right? And we talk about those families, these 20 families, this is how they break down. Access control, there's 25 controls and 122 enhancements. Awareness and training, six controls, 11 enhancements. Audit and accountability, 16 controls, 53 enhancements. Assessment authorization and monitoring, or CA, uh, nine controls, 23 enhancements. Configuration management, 14 uh, controls and 52 enhancements. Contingency planning, 13 and 43. Identification and authentication, 12 and 58. IR, the incident response, 10 and 32. Maintenance, 7 and 23. Media protection, 8 and 22. I'm just kidding. I know this is a little boring right now. Why are you going over this? Because you need to know 
where these controls lie out there. These are questions you may get uh, as you go through things. And let me let me move myself over here. Now we're looking that way. Um, next thing we look at the, the next that's first ten. Your next ten: physical and environmental protection, twenty-three and thirty-six. Planning, eleven and six. Program management, thirty-two and five. Personnel security, nine and nine. Personally identifiable, identifiable information processing and transparency. That's a mouthful. That's one of the new families that used to be in the appendix. So in 853 revision four, this was an appendix. Now it's part of the control catalog. This is that alignment of privacy and security, right? So that's PT eight and 13, risk assessment 10 and 16, uh, system and service acquisition different than supply chain, 23 and 122, system and communication protections, uh, 51 and 111. Those are big, those are two big, old, huge families right there. Uh, system and information integrity, 23 and 95, and supply chain risk management, 12 and 15, another new family. So you're like, oh man, that is just a bunch of text on a screen, right? So let's actually jump in and look at the catalog, right? Before we do that, let's talk about insurance because assurance is introduced. That's not introduced, but it's really highlighted in this revision. So we talk about assurance levels. Um, let's talk about assurance. So this is from a NIST definition. Assurance is grounds for justified confidence that a security or privacy claim has been or will be achieved. Note one, assurance is typically attained uh, relative to a set of specific claims, the scope uh, and focus of such claims may vary, and the claims themselves may be interrelated. And note two, assurance of, obtained through techniques and methods that generate credible evidence uh, s to sustain claims. So we, we want to have proof. We want to proof that the control is in place. We want to have proof that the control is doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? So we get into the catalog. A control or enhancement mark with this weird check mark in the assurance column indicates the control or control enhancement contributes to the ground for confidence that a security or privacy claim has been or will be achieved. Assurance is a critical aspect in determining the trustworthiness of the system. Assurance is a measurement of confidence that the security and privacy functions, features, practice, policies, procedures, mechanisms, and architecture of the organizational systems accurately mediate or enforce established security and privacy policy. So when we see assurance, when we see it in the catalog, now we know what it's all about, right? And I think that's the last slide. I think next one will be the whiteboard. Yeah, next one's the whiteboard. Let's get out of there. Let's get out of there. Let's make this a uh, little bitty again. We'll get that out of there. Look, there's the desktop. And let's grab the under control catalog. And let's jump in to this. Why am I not? Oh, it's got a weird format. Um, let's see if I can fix this formatting here. Oh, why does it do this? Let's, uh, looks like I've got to, there we go. I just got to make it weirder on the screen. Let's get rid of that too. And let's do this. And I'm gonna, one second, guys. We're going to be right into it. There we go. Now I'm going to share. Share the control catalog. And uh, really, really don't like the way that looks. Let's see if we can zoom in on it. That's yeah, a little better, a little bit better. Not perfect. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at the wrong, wrong one. What do we got there? Preview. Preview. There we go. That's a little bit better, guys. That's a little bit better. Um, so this is 853. R5, right? 
So let me grab myself and throw myself over here in this column. Um, again, everyone is going to have this. This publication is free from from NIST. September came out, and it's authority tells us all about it. We're going to jump down to one of the things that's cool about this thing. Is now, now, in the olden days, the um, the table of contents was not hyperlinked, right? So here we see our control families. And let's take, I was like the awareness and training family. Let's go into one of these. And if you've never seen a control, this is what a control looks like, right? So we're going to have some things in here. We have, we are in a new family. This is the awareness and training family. So that's, we know where we're at. We're talking about AT1. And for people new to the catalog, anything that's a dash one is going to be policy and procedure. Prime for inheritance. These should be done at the organization level or at least at least one of the t higher tiers, right? So this is policy and procedures, and generally they all kind of read the same. So it's going to tell us about the control. As a system owner, we need to know about the control. Um, and some of the things we're going to see along the way, right? Um, the control is develop and document and disseminate. So there's three things we've got to do. Develop, document, and disseminate. Two, and here's the first thing we see, this square bracket. The square bracket is what's called an organizationally defined variable. And there's a ton of these things. I haven't counted these yet. It's probably worth counting. But there's two types of organizationally defined variables. One is like this one. It's an assignment, right? So in this one, the organization has to define what personnel or roles the policy and procedure is going to be disseminated to. And that's what we're talking about. We're going we're gonna to develop and document, right? That's the first part. And then we're going to disseminate. We're going to distribute. We're going to get this to who? Who does the policy and procedure have to go to? And that's what the organization has to define. If the organization doesn't define it at tier one or tier two, the system owner has to define this. We shouldn't have any square brackets left in our control when we're done. So hopefully the organization does this. This should be done at the organizational level. This is part of um, defining your common controls, right? So that should be assignment should be made. So we shouldn't have this here. It should be maybe all personnel or all account holders, whatever. There should be a de definition in the square bracket. It should be changed from a square bracket to whatever, right? The other type of organizationally defined variables we see is this other square bracket here, right? So we know we're going to develop, document, and disseminate to, and let's assume that our organization said everyone. So develop, document, and disseminate to all personnel. And then we have to see an the another type of organizationally defined variable. This time, instead of an assignment, it's a selection. NIST is saying, select one or more of the following. So organizational level, mission, business, process level, or system level, awareness and training policy, that. So, so now we're saying, in this sentence, develop. And we're going to say, let's say we're going to say this one is organizational level. right? That's the selection we're making. We're just going to pick one. We could pick one. We could put two, pick two. We could pick all three if we'd like, right? But we're going to say now that we've got those two variables set, the sentence reads like this. Develop, document, and disseminate to all personnel a organization level awareness and training policy that addresses scope, roles, responsibility. So in our policy, we've got to address all of these things. These are all things we can be assessed on. These things all have to appear in our policy. And then, and it's a, it is consistent with laws, executive orders, directives, regulations, policies, and guidelines. And, and then it goes on. So this is, this is the control. This defines what we have to do. We've got to meet all of these requirements, right? So if we do all this thing, we do build this great training program, but maybe we don't address roles. When the assessor comes around, that's a finding, right? You built this great policy, but you didn't address roles. That's a requirement right here. You have to address purpose, scope, roles, responsibility, management commitment, coordination amongst organizational entities, and compliance. Okay, those are all things I can check on. 
And when we get to 53 alpha, there's a place we can document each of those. Does the policy meet all of these? So maybe this doesn't define it well enough for you. You're like, okay, I get it, but I don't get it, right? So discussion. The discussion follows the control and it tells it breaks the control down in a more understandable fashion. So we want to, maybe we don't get this. I don't understand this. So let's go down and read the discussion, right? Next part we get to is related controls. And related controls are important because maybe I can't do this control. And this is probably not a good example because it's a policy control. But if I can't do this, maybe I can find a compensating control in one of these related controls. So I know PM9, PS8, and SI12 are all related controls. So I can hyperlink to any of these. Um, this particular control has no control enhancements. And then finally, this is, a diff this is a big difference between Rev4 and Rev5 because we don't have that implementation details down below here, right? All that information about baselining has been moved out to 53B. So the baseline information doesn't exist. The order of implementation doesn't exist. All that stuff's gone. This is the last line here. These are our references. So I really don't understand what's going on here. I can start reading all of these references and they're gonna tell me a little bit more about the policy and procedure, right? The one thing we didn't cover, right? So the one thing we're missing is control enhancements. This one has no control enhancements. It's just straight up AT1. So if we go down to AT2, we've got the same thing. This time it's gonna expand a little bit. This is literacy, training, and awareness. And this is gonna tell us the same information. Hey, the control, this is what the control is all about. We have our normal discussion section. Down here, it's gonna expand it further to help us understand it. Our related controls, but now new is their control enhancements. So if we have a control enhancement that we're going to implement on our system, it might be AT1, or excuse me, AT2 enhancement one. So that would read AT-1 parentheses, one, end parentheses, right? And the same thing, we've got kind of now a, a, a micro view of an enhancement, right? It's the control, again, this expands on the control. And this may came, come up. You can't have an enhancement without the base control. You can't have AT2 enhancement one without AT2. You gotta have AT2 too. Two, two, man. So. The good thing we see, you know, here's what's going on. Here's the discussion, right? Um, the control is provide practical exercises in literacy training that simulate events and incidents. And that expands on the literacy training and awareness. So you're building this awareness program, right? So this is what a control and an enhancement look like. This is the enhancement, just this part here, not two down there, um, just this. I don't know why it keeps grabbing that, but there's your enhancement. That's enhancement one, here's enhancement two. Some controls have a ton of enhancements. AC2 uh, has a ton, like 22 enhancements. Huge, huge. So that's the first part. That's a control. That's when we look at a control. So we want to look at these things further. We jump back to the back, past everything, past all of this stuff, right? We're, uh, um, and they're all they're broke down by family. So we can look at the families. These are families. We're down to the S S C family down here. And if we keep going, we're going to get to the end of this thing, right? We've got references and all that good stuff. And we're almost, almost there. There we go. There's our big table, right? And in the past, if you're familiar with 853, you know, this is where we used to see that baseline process. We used to, on this table, there was low, moderate, high. We could determine, you know, what's going on here. But the important thing, we kind of alluded to it yesterday, is now one of the big things that NIST did that was really good from 1253 from the CNSS world, the Committee on National Security Systems, CNSS has always had this indicator, should this be an inherited control? And NIST was smart enough to go, that is really a good thing to have in our, in our control catalog, right? So now, I think Rainier or Mike brought it up yesterday, if, if we're looking at all these controls, you know, I've got controls and enhancements at a high benchmark or high baseline level, level of 365 controls and enhancements that I have to implement, that's a lot. That's a lot for a system owner to do. But now we can go through, just like we looked at 
twelve fifty three yesterday. Um, in in that video, we'll, let's see if Mike Mako can put that up there. The vi the video where we talked about twelve fifty three. That of course that was revision four. So we need to look at revision five. So what they've done in this implemented by, um, they've done the same thing. They haven't really said inherited, but they put this O, right? If there's an O in this column, that means it's, it's, it's prime for the organization to implement. When we see O, that means it's a common control, right? Um, if we see an S, on the other hand, like this one, that's a system level control. And obviously, if we see this one, OS, that's either a, con com either a common control, a system control, or a hybrid control, right? So there's a little, little more work on the OS ones. But these ones are straightforward. S, system level. O, organizational level. And then we have the insurance. And that's what assurance. And that's why we talked about assurance before we jumped into the deck. Um, so this is a great table. This covers all, all of the controls in 853 and all of the enhancements. So we can see them, uh, AC6, right? Let's go back to AT2, I always like AC2. It's a huge, huge control, right? Um, so AC2, account management, uh, and then we see all the enhancements. This is 13, I guess, here. Um, thought that was a lot more than that. Oh, there we go, that's what I was thinking about. AC4, information flow enforcement. Look at all these enhancements. 32 enhancements on this one. And they're all hyperlinked, so we want to look at the enhancement. Uh, and, and obviously they're all, they're all either system level, OS level, or organization level, or organization system level. Um, the other thing we see on the table here is, is these that are grayed out. Um, these are controls that are withdrawn. They still exist in the control catalog because maybe you had an older system that had them in place and you need to know where they went. So it's gonna tell you AC4 enhancement 18 has been incorporated into AC 16. So it's gone. The requirement's still there, but they just put it, made it as part of AC 16. So that's your, let's get the docker off there. That's your overview, right? We're talking about the risk management framework. That's overview of revision five of 853. There's a bit of front matter we didn't cover. And we'll leave that for another day because we are running a little bit long. So. Cody, morning. Good to see you. Um, did you cover RMF control application to Docker yet? And we didn't go specifically to Docker. We just talked more about um, the the application of these controls can help reduce that vulnerability we talked about. And, and this is a good example. Like we talked yesterday about building a... a um, A baseline, a specific baseline for something. So we can talk about a specific baseline for Docker, right? Um, and I don't think there's 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 not one built, but let me see something. I'm trying to get the web browser that I need um, on here. You get another part of this. Good practice services like iAssure for generating SCP and related ATO documents. Is it a good Oh, sorry. Is it a good practice to use services like iAssure for generating SCP-related cybersecurity ATO documents? Um, iAssure is a vendor. Um, I they've got a different model than everyone else. I I can't say anything bad about iAssure. Um, iAssure is veteran-owned. You know, I'm, I'm going to like that to start with. It's veteran-owned, and iAssure does some great things. iAssure developed procedures for every single family in 853 revision 4 and i'm sure they're already working on procedure templates for revision 5 they're good folks over there and they they have a different pricing model um they have a different pricing model for the way they they built they build their services um i think they're good people i think personally i think if you don't have the ability to do it because of resources, time, or whatever, but you have the money to be able to pay for the service. I would, I would probably go with someone like iAssure. I like iAssure, generally. I've never met the folks. It'd be good, good to talk to the folks. Um, iAssure does. I'm, I'm gonna bring them up. I.
it won't make sure I've got the right eye assure here. There we go. Yeah. Um, let me switch, flip, switch back over to this view and then switch to. So this is what we're talking about eye assure. Um, DSS RMF toolkit. Lots of stuff these guys do. They, they are doing a lot of great things. Um, I don't know if they still have them out here. Oh man, let me do that. You go back. RMF templates, I'm sure this is where it's under. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what they've done um, is they've created templates for all of these different procedures. Now these aren't policies, it's a procedure level. So, and they're done really well. Um, they did a good job and they very well aligned to the the uh, control families, right? Um, and if you look, there, there's like 9,000 downloads, 9,000 downloads, 12,000 downloads. People have downloaded these a lot and they provide them. And again, think these guys do um, some great things. If you are the, a government employee, if you're a government organization, you're free to use these and, and, and do what you want. Um, they do have some stipulations of your contract, you're consulting, and you're providing these services to someone else. You're making someone pay for your services. There's some different uh, requirements in here. But yeah, this is Iasher, I think. I think they're pretty good folks. I've, I've never met them. But I know they're veterans. The last time, I, unless they sold out. Uh, yeah, employer support, support of the Guard and Reserve. Um, yeah, these guys do some things. Their model's a little different. So I guess the, the, point, uh, the point is is a good practice. If you have a reputable vendor, um, someone like Iasher, I think is a, a reputable vendor. They're, they're pretty good. Um, no, it looks like, it looks like uh, Lance is asking, or someone's asking, I guess it's not Lance. Someone's asking if the internet went down. I don't think so. Um, so that's one thing. You know, that's, that's why if you have to use someone like Iasher, they, they're, they're a good one to use. They're the company seems to be solid. Um, so I, I, I like them. Um, if you, I don't know, if, Cody, have you ever dealt with them? I, I, I have not actually dealt one-on-one -on -one with them. I should probably reach out to them um, to see, you know, if we can get, get talking to them. They do some great things. They, on, they, they, they used to have a cool database that you could go out and, and do some manipulation of of control controls for ATO documentation and stuff, but that that went away with uh, the newer documents. Um, so cool. Um, I forgot what I was going to do out here, but I guess it's not that important. We're r running out of time anyway. So uh, hopefully this provides you a good overview of NIST Special Publication 853 uh, Revision 5. Um, this is the kind of stuff we talk about in the RMF course, the Cyber Recon RMF course. If you're thinking about learning more about, you know, RMF, I think the, the coursework we have together is a good one. Um, gives you more in depth. We put a lot of these videos out online, so you can learn it in case you can't, for some reason, can't afford to take the course. We'll put the videos out and check them out. You don't get all the good extra stuff. You don't get the interactive videos. You don't get the handouts. You don't get the exercise. You don't get the labs. You don't get the quizzes. That's the stuff you get in the course, um, but I think, you know, it's a, it's a good place to learn. Learn this stuff, man. There's a, RMF is a great tool to use to secure your environment. So you know, you, use some of the docs for the AC control. AC is a huge family, man. Access control. I was like, access control controls. Uh, the AC is a huge, huge family um, to work with. So hopefully, I don't know if you, give you want to share your review what you thought of iAssure, how they did for you, how how they worked out, was it a good good solid product they provided to you? How how was your what was your feeling about iAssure and providing you some support for the AC family? That's some tasty coffee. Um, don't forget on the nineteenth. Well, I'll wait for Coyote to respond. Uh, don't forget the nineteenth is our next trivia night free trivia night come out you can win something win yourself a prize or two like uh mike bravo always wins a prize or two sometimes all the prizes but come out 
try your security chops. See how you do. See how you stack up against your competition. Um, it starts at 7 p.m. East Coast time right here on the YouTube. We'll use Socrative for the answering of the questions. And we'd love to see you there. Come win a prize. Show your show you, show who's got the chops. And that's I think that's going to wrap it up today. I think that's all we got to talk about. We take out take care of your friends, your family, your coworkers. Take care of your organization. Take care of each other. Growing a community here for you guys to hang out with. Providing experience. Coyote, thank you this morning for sharing experience with Iassure, a great organization. If you're building procedure level documents and you're doing the RMF, go go out to Iassure. Check out what they got for free. It's worth. It's worth. Um, just looking, looking at it. It's worth. Their stuff's weight in gold. Um, they're just. It's. They're good documents. They're tied in tightly with the controls. If you do them, um, if you use their documents, you, you make it's aligned perfectly. Uh, auditors will come around, your SCAs will come around, security control assessors, you're locked in. You, it, each paragraph is tied to the control. It's very, very tightly coupled with the, the framework. The results are not in Bravo's favors. favor. Will he contest them? Uh, I don't know, Bravo. <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, we'll see if he gets his lawyers involved. Coyote's back. Overall, the depth of support, products provided, Several nights of searching for guides on the internet. Uh, it's free internally too. Yeah, hey. And why wouldn't you go if you get it free initially too? Yeah, uh, if you get it free, they, they do a lot of good stuff, man. Um, I'm going to reach out to them today, see if we can't talk to them. Good morning, Mike. Coming in at the end, but you can always go back and watch it. If you want to listen to this uh, in its audio-only format, of course, we put that on the podcast later today. Um, love to see you hit the subscribe over there. Love to see you share with your friends, your family, your coworkers. Share with people that want to get into risk management, people that want to get into security. Um, we won't be just covering risk management. It just happens to be where we're at this week. We'll talk about some security topics as well. We'll talk about the controls. We'll get our schedule back up and running. Probably next week we'll get that schedule back out there. It's been rough, but appreciate you guys coming and joining us, spending some time this morning. Um, yeah, if you want 53 Bravo, this is the video to watch. Uh, and Michael, check it out later. Michael, watch this thing later. Um, I'll have Mako trim it down to just the 53 part. Uh, so we can post that on, and it'll be part of the lesson as well in the courseware. So if you could share with your friends, hit that like button, hit the smash the like button. It helps the logarithm. Uh, YouTube will be more kind to us if you do that. And other than that, we'll see you tomorrow morning, 0730, right here, same bat time, same bat channel. Thanks for being here. We'll see you then.